Yeah. About? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, um, as I mentioned before, that w the point here was just to give a historical review. It wasn't meant to necessarily give a full system because just to kind of explain aqidah takes several lectures, not just one. There's only so much that I can speak about in one hour. And the point here was to show, first of all, that there are active Muslims, Muslims who come from scientific backgrounds and also have an alamiya background, engaging with these without issue. So it's not to say that there are no answers. There are answers here. It's just a matter of now knowing how to get to those answers. So that's the first thing. Number two... The question about atheism and science is a question about whether science in of itself leads to atheism. And that question will be answered on Sunday. But my answer to that very simply is no. There's nothing in inherent to science that leads to atheism. Whatever science discovered is a creation of God. So if something is created by God and we're discovering it, there's no problem for us. When, for example, we discovered Big Bang or multiverses, perhaps Allah created it this way. Wallahu alam. Right? The whole point of theology is to show exactly the nature of Allah, the nature of creation, and how those two things are related. That's aqidah. That's basic aqidah for you. Once you learn those three things, the rest of the science conversations become easy to understand. Yeah. I think you perhaps have already alluded to that. Uh, we have to perhaps wait for your next lecture on Sunday. But if you're having a conversation with a person who's not religious or who believes in uh, Darwinism, evolution, yeah. what are one or two things that you can say to them to sort of, uh, you know, at least get the conversation started in the way of, you know, religion versus from an Islamic standpoint? Right. Uh, okay. So on on the point of rev, uh, evolutionism. So, when we talk about evolution, right, the main thing that comes up in evolution is that evolution means there is no God. God is out of the window. That's how Richard Dawkins presents it. That evolution means, khalas, we have an explanation of life, therefore we don't need God anymore. What he's actually arguing for is not evolution versus God. He's actually arguing for a position known as naturalism, which he is then plugging through evolution. Naturalism is a worldview that believes nature is all there is. That's it. That's naturalism, right? Under the picture of naturalism, it's not just evolution that means there's no God. Everything in science then is just nature. There is no God. Physics, chemistry, mathics become naturalistic. So what Richard Dawkins is doing is he's confusing his philosophy for the science. And that's why many other atheist professors are against Richard Dawkins. There is a very famous uh, atheist professor here in the US in Florida State University. His name is Michael Ruse. He himself states, he's one of the biggest atheist professors in the world, that M Richard Dawkins is an embarrassment. Why did he say that? Because his arguments are flimsy. What he's arguing for is not evolution versus God. What he's actually arguing is that I believe nature is all there is. I believe in evolution. Therefore, for me, evolution means no God. But that doesn't mean evolution means no God isn't behind the, the process. Does that answer it? Yeah. Do we have any sisters uh, question upstairs or downstairs? We do have a mic upstairs. Yes. Mike, it's not a question. It's a point for everyone here. I don't like this lecture. Our sons and our daughters uh, they shouldn't hear such a thing. And this box that he threw on us, we don't know if it's authentic, if it's good, if it's bad. Even the people who talked about the four or five, he tried to teach us their names. We, we don't know. We don't have a review about it. And the masjid didn't, didn't allow anyone to come with such lecture to everyone and spread it in our community. Thank you, I sister. have to say that. Thank you, sister, and for there's the other sisters here, they didn't like it. Okay, thank you, sister. Okay, um, we have a question here. Um, I have a question about um, not atheism because there is a lot of atheists actually who are taking positions now of uh, being de deism. Uh, so also 
do we have a work also from Islamic scholars about uh, uh, against not uh, be, like deism actually? Sorry, sorry, say again. Uh, against being deist. 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 Yes. What What about this? Uh, like there are some uh, atheists, famous atheists, becomes like deism instead of atheism. So yeah. do we have any work also against the idea of deism? So deism is the position that there was a God, he started creation, but then he left that creation. Like for example, if I create this laptop, I create the laptop, then I left it, right? Now, when we, we believe as Muslims that God didn't leave creation, he's still creating you. Who's maintaining your existence right now? Allah. Who's maintaining the existence of all of us here? Allah at this very moment. So there are arguments in place. For example, there's Dalil Imkan and Dalil Huduth. These are basic arguments that you study in Aqidah. Once you see these arguments, it makes it very clear that God can never leave, so to speak, like the deist positions. So the same arguments that are used against atheism are equally used against deism. And they take care of that problem. Do we have any sisters that have a question? Okay, we have a brother here then. Yes? yes? Okay. Here you go, sister. Watch out. Here you go. Salam alaikum. Waalaikum That was really loud, sorry. Um, so is it fair to say that science and religion are compatible because two million years prior to the humans that we know today as Homo sapiens, two million years prior to that, Homo habilis were the first humans known, according to scientists. So if we say that humans existed, like, like we went through the evolutionary process, but, pro but Prophet Adam alayhi salam was the first prophet in human form, wouldn't that be a way to kind of throw the atheists off? So... Um, because we're not arguing that Prophet Adam alayhi salam was the first human. We're saying he was the first prophet in human form, created by God, but humans still existed prior to that. So evolution did happen and is therefore compatible with Islam. So when we, when we talk about humans in biology, um, there is a difference I, in opinion of what, what we mean by human beings in biology, right? So in human evolution, biologists have various divisions. They have something called Homo sapiens, Denisovans, Neanderthals, Homo erectus. Where does humanity start and when does it end? This is something evolutionary biologists have, have disagreed about. So that's, that's one thing. With regards to from the theology side, we believe that Adam a.s. was the first of insan. There's no doubt about it whatsoever, right? What's his biological profile is the question mark. And I think that's where the, the difficulty comes in. The point to your question is, you know, wherever he was or whenever he was, could there be others, you know, that could have, you know, come through? That's possible. There's no, there's no possibility, there's no denying that whatsoever. But I'd say there's, there's ambiguity about how we define human beings both in bi biology and theology. They're slightly, they're not necessarily the same thing. Does that, does that help a little bit? Sorry? Yeah, so the, the, interestingly, atheists cannot uh, deny miracles. So why can't they deny miracles? So they study regularities in nature, right? Like, so for example, if I drop this, I drop it again, I drop it again, I drop it again. I can generalize a law out of it, right? I can generalize a law. Scientists are studying regularities in nature. Now let's say, for example, 2,000 years ago, a miracle occurred. Scientists just believe regularities. They don't believe in exceptions to those regularities. They can neither study them, neither can they deny them. So from an atheistic standpoint, they have nothing to say about miracles, including Adam alayhi salam. Does that make sense? So let me give you an example, right? Do you believe in the theory of gravity? Yes or no? Do, you, do scientists believe in, in, in physics, generally speaking? Yep. Do scientists believe in laws of chemistry? Yes or no? They do, right? So now, here today in the 21st century, 
Can I prove or disprove about an event that took place, let's say 5,000 years ago, let's just say, where somebody's staff converted into a snake. Can I disprove or disprove that today? No. Science can neither say anything about it, nor it can deny anything about it. Does that make sense? So from a scientific point, you have nothing to say. Our beliefs in miracles don't come from science, they come from revelation. So if something in revelation is stating that a miracle occurred, our belief is predicated on that. Does that make sense now? Right? Is that clear? Good. Okay. Um, so number one is uh, some 12-year-old kid named Suleiman. Is he here? Okay, your mom is looking for you by the car. You need to meet her there. Uh, secondly, uh, because of the rain situation and everybody being forced inside, so inshallah, we're not going to go the extra time. We'll pray at 1010 inshallah. Uh, so we'll go for a few more questions. And inshallah, after that, uh, Sheikh is here with us. You can talk to him personally, inshallah. So we'll take uh, just the last five questions, 30 second questions, and one minute answers. Th okay. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is. Uh, if you have any idea about the relation between the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا ما علاقتها بالساينس؟ في على الواتساب بعض مرات إجانا ل we got some video for Professor Jeffrey from Kansas University and he elaborated on that that عَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا uh, it, it means uh, the science that we're going to discover. As, as a human, we don't know all the names, but all the things, but we, uh, the, the, the door is open for us to search and find. Yeah. If you have any idea or if you can elaborate on this, thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, on this, so just to kind of help everybody get on the same page, there is a verse in Surat Al-Baqarah when, when Adam Al -Salam is created, right? So Adam السلام, was taught something, right? Al Asma. And in the tafsir, there have been a variety of opinions about what was he taught exactly. Some people, some of us say that he was taught, you know, one language. Some people say that it was taught all languages. Some ulama said that they, he was just taught the name of the NBA or of all of humanity or everything that existed. So there is an opinion that said that he knew about everything that existed. With regards to science, I mean, is that what you're saying? Whether he knew modern science? Could be. The, the verse is open enough. It'd be interesting to know if, if that is the case. But wallahu alam. It's, yani, it's possible. Yumkin, it's possible. Asalaamu Alaikum. <clears throat> so my original question was on Islam, uh, basically... Uh, uh, versus science conflict on miracles, but you mentioned that scientists study regularity. Yeah. Okay. In that case, they can see what happens when people die. Entire body, everything, all organs, including the 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 blood and the heart and everything is there, but something is taken out. Soul how the science basically proves that there is a physical thing or something is taken out, soul, and also the belief we have is on unseen, whereas science does not believe in that. Yeah. Part of our belief is unseen. Good. So in, in, the, in, the, in the lecture on, on Sunday, we will be talking about the limits of science, right? So... The function of aqidah is to teach you about things that Allah has informed us that are inaccessible to science. So for example, there's no scientific proof for jinn. Jinn are in an invisible space. There's no scientific proof for angels. They're, again, they're not visible to us. Heaven, hellfire, they're not there. So what we know some things from theology come just from revelation which we believe is a source of proof for us to believe in. Science can only measure and study the natural world. As a result, it can never exhaustively explain things. So, and this is something again I'll repeat on Sunday. 
the fact that there are regularities in nature, right? So for example, if I drop this, the theory of gravity is causing it to fall down. Science presumes there are regularities, but it cannot prove those regularities. It must have those assumptions in place in order for it to do science. If those assumptions were not there, science would not function. So if, if you believe that the world was not regular, if I drop it, it goes here, then it goes here, then it goes here, you couldn't do science. So the very fact that science relies on assumptions shows that science cannot fully explain everything. And we'll hopefully expand it because what's, what atheists end up doing is they believe science becomes an ideology for them. That science is the only way of looking at things. Which is where Muslims and atheists disagree. For them, science is the end all and be all. For Muslims, there is the natural world. We believe there is a created world. But there are also things beyond that. So that's the difference between the two. Does that help? Assalamu alaikum. So, um, I think you somewhat answered it, but um, is it, so isn't it a fool's errand to, cry, to try to combine theology and religion and science? I mean, science is, the goal of science is to observe in a phenomena, whether it's uh, 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 at the quantum level or the macro level, observe it and hypothesize, and then do experiments to prove or disprove it, right? Yeah. Ultimately, theology comes to belief, right? It's just a matter of belief. You cannot prove it. Yeah. It is something that you accept. So isn't it a fool's errand to try to combine them? So um, I think the word combine is where um, there might be some difficulty. So, if you're, so, so the function of theology is to explain some things that science cannot. As you rightly said, science tells us how the world works, right? Particles, medicine, physics, all of that. Science will get you that far. But science will not tell you why the world exists, who created the world. They're looking at the same thing, but from different perspectives. Yeah, that's not the, exactly, that's not the goal of science. The goal, like, as I said before, science can only study the natural world. That is its scope. Theology tells you why you can do science to begin with. That's the difference. Does that help? What, what, sorry? What's up? Is that, yeah, you, you made it work. Uh, you, your question, um, the description that you made of the of the historical background from 1880 to 1920, 1960, and the impact of the Christian uh, words described in those books on the Muslims were phenomenal because it created a lot of doubts in Muslim community also. My question is that when the other side Islamization of the knowledge came through, and several books you mentioned there in every field almost that came through. How did it impact the Christian uh, philosophers or Christian uh, authors and the, the regular people in the Christian world about those things? How, how did, just to be clear, how did the Islamiza Islamization of the science movement impact Christianity or Christian scholars? Yes, Christian scholars. Okay. Right, so um, uh, I'm not personally aware of any material written by Christian thinkers on what they thought of Islamization of science. What I do know, however, is that some people did try to do something similar. So one of the bigger, biggest like, uh, theistic philosophers, his name is Alvin Plantinga. He's one of the biggest guys. He's one of the biggest defenders of faith. Muslims, Christians, look up to him. He wrote a few things about how we can have a Christian science. Now, whether he was influenced by the Islamization, I cannot tell you, but that's the only thing that comes to mind right now. Uh, so, my question is, it's already difficult enough for us to engage in those discussions with atheists, yeah. especially when, 
what we be, what our Islam is all about faith, and sometimes it's not founded in science. Science is all about truth and evidence and tangible beliefs and things like that. Yeah. My question is how how do our kids engage in those discussions in their schools, especially in public schools with their teachers or yeah. other kids who do not share the same belief, the same teachings, and are asking for the tangible evidence for things like miracles and things like that, that our kids might want to engage in, in discussions or present about in schools, but don't have the same kind of logic uh, that we're talking about here to explain that theology to, to their peers. Okay, so I think there might be two questions in here. Are you asking how we should teach theology or how we should teach our children to engage with people of other faiths? The, the latter. The latter, okay. So. My personal opinion is, because, so I came from a background where I personally had difficulties with miracles. In engineering, you are stuck to think about very scientific things, right? And so, once I started learning theology, particularly like basic, basic books on the basic books, you then easily kind of get an understanding of how things are, right? When it comes to if you have that in place, if you have aqidah in place, a solid teaching in aqidah, when you now come to different worldviews, the first thing is to teach your children emotional uh, tolerance, right? Because we live in a world where there are going to be different opinions. We, th that is the first thing they must know, that not everybody is going to share the same mind space as you do. The second thing is that you can have dialogue that is both healthy for each of you. The problem is that because the background theology hasn't been taught, or maybe taught incorrectly, perhaps, when people don't have questions, they immediately get anxiety. So when they don't have answers, they immediately get anxiety. So just yesterday, for example, I was speaking to a, a young uh, imam from Australia. So his father is a sheikh, you know, he, so he has a family where he's surrounded by shiuch. But even he had like anxiety issues, right? And so we had a chat for half an hour, and he was able to express those doubts in terms of where they were coming from. And it turns out that it was because he misunderstood one principle, and once that was fixed, everything kind of came through after that. So I believe that these two things need to work together in tandem. On the one hand, we need to make sure that theology is taught very carefully. And that's why it's called usul al-din. Ilm al-Kalam is, or, or Aqid is called Usul al-Din. It is the primary foundational principle of your religion. It precedes fiqh, it precedes Usul al-Hadith. It's the primary base of religion. If that's not there, these things crumble very quickly. And that's the key point. So I believe those two things need to be there. The correct knowledge, but also teaching emotional tolerance to your children. And just letting them un understand that you might c come across opinions that they, you know, they may not agree with you. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that you have to be on the same page. You try your best to articulate your opinion, your perspective, and that's what you do. After all, all of us are messengers in the shadow of the Prophet ﷺ. What does da'wah mean? To call. And we do it with the best of our ability. Some of us are better than others. Right? So, we do our best. We pass the message on. Hidayah comes from whom? Allah. JazakAllah, we will not get ready for <coughs> Salat, inshallah. Is that it? Thank you. Barak Lafiq, thank you. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاه حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح 
الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله استوى عتيد ويرحمكم الله <تصفيق> الله أكبر سبحانك الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجاء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأنا له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثك وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي الله أكبر سمي الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل هو الله أحد لله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يقل له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمي الله لمن حمده الله أكبر
Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Sami Allahu liman hamida. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Sami Allah liman hamida. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Shoaib Ahmad Malik to come all the way, give a wonderful khutbah and a really nice lecture. Jazakumullah hai, may Allah bless you and reward you for all the work you're doing. Inshallah, we got it. you're going to have a really good weekend, very active weekend, inshallah, in a masjid. Tomorrow, um, in the morning, I mean, after, uh, noon to two, uh, Sheikh uh, Jawad, Imam Jawad has a program for youth, boys and girls, aged 11 to 16. And then in the afternoon or the evening, we have another visiting scholar, Dr. Mayan al Khuda. A lot of people know him. He's one of the preeminent scholars in Islam and finance. He's going to come here after Maghrib and give a nice lecture on all the questions you may have related to stocks and bonds and um, uh, you, you name it, all these new you know, financial tools. 
Sunday, inshallah, uh, this Sunday our Imam will not be here to do the khatra, but we'll have the breakfast program followed by the exercise and meditation class for men. And then at um, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., we have the first ever health fair. It's completely free. You can come. The information is on the website, so on the WhatsApp. And then 2 to 4, actually right after Doha to 4.30, we have a CPR class. So inshallah, we'll have a lot of good programs and make it a point to join, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Yes, yes. Yeah, very important point. If you want to come for the health fair, you can have your uh, blood work done or cholesterol checked. Make sure you're fasting, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Um, just want to mention that anybody that had questions, we apologize that we had to cut it short uh, because of the rain and everybody being inside and not really having a lot of um, quiet time to be able to listen. So anybody that did not get to ask, inshallah, you can ask the sheikh and any sisters that didn't get to ask, inshallah, you can come down and I will make sure that I will bring the sheikh to you so you can listen. Also, um, Dr. Shuaib Malik, actually he teaches a lot of courses online for a lot of very well-known Islamic institutions that are headed by major scholars under their leadership and there's a lot of stuff from him on YouTube so inshallah you can follow up if you want to study more in depth because you know he's not your regular Imam type he is the expert in the field of Islam and science and the intersection so inshallah if you're specifically interested in that field inshallah you will find a lot of beneficial stuff online Jazakumullah khair
like the lens or something. Or maybe someone started moving it.
Can I put it right here? Here. 